Hi everybody, this is Coach Joe and I've got a very important question today for you. On the topic of microloading versus macroloading, how much load does it take to negatively impact a specific high-speed sport movement? We know the answer, do you? Today's session we're going to be talking about microloading. You might be wondering why are we talking about microloading? Well, it's a current topic. We're having these conversations every day now and I think it's not just us. Globally, people are looking at small load. And what I mean when I say the word load, just so you understand, is I'm just talking about weight. Load, weight, resistance, they all mean the same thing. Loaded training, weight training, resistive training. So don't get too confused to that. But you're going to be hearing about this and so we're jumping in to try and explain it to you because there's a lot of stuff coming out there and it's not all so accurate. And all the big trends in the world right now are moving towards light. You look at the top fitness and sport trends in the world, uh, body weight training, HIIT training, high intensity training, speed training, wearable resistance and wearable tech. These all lend themselves to this topic and you're going to start hearing conversations around microloading. So we're going to try and debunk and explain a bit of that now. And here at Lilo, you know, we're working on developing and pioneering these concepts. Technical conditioning, microloading, assistive and resistive loading. Some of the things that you're going to learn more about and we have series on these. So do check out some of the other videos we have. So before we talk about microloading, we kind of need to talk about macroloading, right? It's a spectrum because traditionally we've had macroloading. And before I give you some examples about macro loading, I just want you to understand one basic difference. Macro loading is generally measured in pounds and kilos, or even X amount or percentages or multiples of your body weight. For general adaptation and speed and power and movement and skill, whatever it might be. And micro loading is measured in grams and ounces. And that also provides adaptations in the same areas, but very specific. So, Let's take a look at what macro loading is. So macro loading, you see it all around me here. Here we are at a gym. This was one of our first tools that ended up in the toolbox as a strength coach. Weight training, some version of resistance that's heavy. We take a look here in the squat rack. We've got plates, you know, 20, 15, 10, five kilos. That's your 44 pound if you're uh, over there in North America. Selectorized plates are measured in those angles. Dumbbells here, macro loading. I think even the smallest one we've got here in the gym is 2.5 kilos. That's about a five pounder. You know they go down to like one pound. Then you've got your medicine balls. And this morning we were on a podcast and somebody even mentioned that you notice even medicine balls are getting lighter and lighter, half pound, one pound. But these are still quite macro. And even things like fractional plates, you know, smaller plates, this is a two pound, two and a half pound plate. They go down as little as half a pound and a pound now. But these are also considered macro loading. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Now let's go down to micro loading. So this is an exigen roll up, a bunch of the loads we have. Micro loading, and these are our loads, specifically come in small increments. That's a 200 gram, eight ounce size. Here's a 100 gram, four ounce size. And yes, even in 50 gram, two ounce size. And you might think, well, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, that's the weight of a chocolate bar. But trust me, this has relevance when you start to get into specific movement training. Does this little load actually have value? Is it relevant? Well, we're going to make a case today for that. If we, but to understand it simply, and anybody who's in the strength and conditioning field, certainly the training field, understands the force velocity curve, right? If we take a look at the force velocity curve here, we see that there is a ton of tools and equipment that can macro load us. High force, but they tend to be low speed. Even if you have the intention of speed, it's slow. Then we move down the curve and we start to see some of the more lighter tools that are starting to develop cables and tubings, uh, kettlebells, uh, sort of weighted shirts and, and ankle weights and wrist weights and something like a dumbbell or sorry, a medicine ball. That's fitting the middle of the curve. It's medium load, medium weight, but still only medium speed. But we don't have a lot that works where most, if not all sport happens high speed, light load. Now all of a sudden that little load makes a huge difference. And I can give you tons of examples of it, but we see this, that when we're doing specific training with athletes, light is the new heavy. And some interesting thing happens when you put a load like this on the body. The first thing is it's heavier than you think because it's not the same as a resistance that's applied like a weight vest or a shirt or a squat rack. That only works at the point of contact and the ground. But if you're a sprinter and you're getting moving through running mechanics, yes, the weight is there when you put the force in the ground. That's when you're going to use energy. 
But when you lift that leg and you go through your in-air mechanics, the weight is also there. So the light load is working the entire movement cycle, whether you're in the air, whether you're on the ground, whether you're extending, rotating, whatever it is, it's always there. And so you get the cumulative effect of time. And that's why we get athletes around the world putting this load on, running drills, full speed, full movements, and saying, that's a lot heavier than I thought it was going to be. Because it's not three sets of 10. Well, that's a wrap on microloading. I hope it helped you understand a little more, more about what this is in terms of concept. You are going to be hearing about it. But there's one last thing I want to share because once you set, accept and understand microloading, you're going to be looking for tools to help you with that. Your tools have to match the way we work. And the standard way a strength coach or a coach or a fitness person works is they follow the laws of periodization. When they meet athletes or clientele, they have to individualize their programs. They have to make them specific. They have to adhere to the laws of progressive overload and overtraining, or else whatever they're going to do isn't going to work long-term. And so our tools have to reflect that. So if you have a five kilo medicine ball and you keep using that over and over again, how are you gonna individualize that? Because different people need different loads in different places. Two, it's not very specific, so you can't adjust it to movements. Three, you can't progressively overload that. You can if you go from a one, two, or three kilo medicine ball, but even that if it's too big. And the last one, because you can't do the things I just mentioned, you're not going to address the needs of overtraining. When we designed Exogen, and when you look for your tools, look for something most importantly that can be individualized, can work specifically whether you're climbing on a climbing wall, swimming in the pool, or running on the track, because different movements have different needs. And most important, that is progressive. There's a reason we have a low range, 50, 100, 200, 300 grams, and you could progress that through percentage of body weight. Because the SNC around microloading is the same around macroloading. We progress over weeks, we progress over time, we upload, we download, and we allow that cycle to work with the hormonal response you get in general adaptation. So keep that in mind when you're looking for tools that are gonna add value to your toolbox and microloading, and let's keep moving forward.